Uh, I was just actually there in the UK for the last month. I only got back oh, last really? week. Oh, yeah. no way. I oh. was in the north, though. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I was in uh, Leeds. Oh, okay. And... Yeah, Yorkshire. Yeah. Yeah, I was in Yorkshire and there, kind of the um, and around there as well. Um, I was working on a pro. I was working on a project, but I can't really talk that much about it. Oh. But it was, but it was, it was a documentary project, and it was great. I loved being there. I love being in the UK. You know, I loved I loved Leeds. I didn't like Leeds. I loved Leeds. I so my in-laws used to live in a place called Worksop, which is near Sheffield, which is not too far away from Leeds and Bradford. And people I know I know Sheffield. Yeah, everyone's so friendly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't people get that friendly. down here. <laughs> We're far the less it, The coronation wasn't much of a thing up there, I will say. Oh really? Oh. That's like, interesting. It was like just another Saturday. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Did you do anything for it personally? I went around with my camera wanting to kind of find some, you know, just evidence of the coronation. And I like barely found anything. Like <laughs> yeah. there, there were a few, there were a few people dressed up that were at some pubs wearing some fake crowns, but mostly it was just like a, kind of a hot like just a shopping holiday yeah mm. that's that sounds intrinsically british actually we 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 have all this pomp and ceremony and stuff and then we just like ah i couldn't give a oh, fuck I'm not about bothered. that <laughs> uk doesn't have they, they, i mean uk's got a lot of problems but but they're different problems mm. and it, it's nice to have a break from our problems yeah. <laughs> i can imagine we'll, we'll definitely get onto some of that stuff um are you okay if we just sort of crack on are you happy for yeah to totally. dive in? well i wanted to say thank you obviously for coming on but what would be really great for those who are uninitiated with you and your work would be to find out a little bit about your journey you know how you got into filmmaking obviously documentaries and then obviously that path towards catfish so I don't know if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, that love of filmmaking, where that came from, how you sort of started that journey. Sure. Um, you know, I just, I th a friend of mine gave me a book when I went uh, for my 15th birthday. I'd always loved movies and I was an only child and my parents both worked and I grew up in New York City. And so I would come home after school and it would just be me. And I would watch the same couple movies over and over and over again until my parents came home from work. So, you know, I I spent a lot of time alone with movies and TV. And I, I guess I just developed a love for it. And then when I was 15, a friend of mine got me this book by Robert Rodriguez called Rebel Without a Crew. And it was kind of just his journal of making El Mariachi and how he made that movie for $7,000, just kind of all by himself using his wits and his resources that were available to him. And something about that really just, I don't know, awakened something in me, just the idea that you could kind of really do it yourself. Mm. And that amazingly coincided with, just the very beginning of Final Cut Pro, which was kind of, I was always a computer nerd. Just I liked computers and I spent a lot, you know, again, only child, just spent a lot of time at home alone. You know, computers were something I was spent a lot of time doing. And all of a sudden you could edit on a computer and you didn't need kind of all the, and, and there were like video cameras and camcorders and stuff. And so I got really into that kind of from the computer nerd side of it as opposed to the storytelling okay, side that's of it interesting what were the t what were the two movies that you keep watching over and over again i'm just interested <laughs> to know what those two movies were this might this might be critical to yeah us our, our future conversation you know it's it's almost a little too revealing i'm, I'm happy to <laughs> i'm happy to say but it's like it's both it's both embarrassing and is it poor and extremely <laughs> revealing and probably will you know pulls back the curtain on ev all the mystique okay yeah but you know they were porn isn't a documentary just to let you know <laughs> no no it was close no it was flash dance 
Okay, that's fine. <laughs> and and Footloose. Oh, okay. Mm, Quite good. similar ilks then. Mm. Very similar yeah. ilks. Kind of, you know, 1980, the best of 1984 yeah. um, or whatever, five. But yeah, it was those two, those two movies mostly. One time my, my parents, um, they were going out and they, I guess at this point we didn't own those movies. And so they thought they rented me Flashdance but they actually rented me flesh dance <laughs> which okay yeah is, i didn't Very like it different. as much oh you didn't like it oh how wholesome I was, <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah I, and that kind of like i have always been really um drawn to music driven type projects um and w even if i'm making a project that's not music driven I generally find a way to weave music into it in a in a way. I'm I'm again, I kind of come at all that film stuff mostly from a musical perspective, even the editing mm -hmm. part. Um so yeah, I I'd say that those two movies really <laughs> formed formed me. Wow. Not uh, the, um not the answer I was sorry. expecting. <laughs> what were you what did you think? Uh, probably like Rocky or something, something, uh -huh. something butch and manly. Something more masculine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, um, I think a lot of us, I mean, I remember I was having this conversation with someone the other day and when we used to go to the video store, Blockbusters or whatever it was, we, there was always certain films I'd always get out again and again. Mm. Like we would never like look for something new. And and one of those movies for me was The Highlander. I don't know if you remember that movie with um, oh, well, yeah. Christopher Lambert and Sean Connery. And Sean Connery's accent yeah. is horrendous in it. Like he, I think he's, he says something like, uh, I am Rodriguez from Spain, you know, and like his <laughs> Scottish accent. Um, but I even remember then thinking this was like a terrible movie. But it, again, every time we went back, oh, I think I'll get The Highlander out again. Um, yeah. It's what, funny how we did that as kids. Like you just want to watch the same movies again and again and again. Didn't that have quite I, a well, vibey soundtrack I, I, as well? Did. Sorry. <laughs> you go. Sorry, stop interrupting us, Flex. We're having a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I just um, said it's quite a vibey soundtrack as well. That one. It is uh, a vibey Highlander. soundtrack. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's uh... vibey, vibey sound. I mean, like, I think that maybe is a generational thing where. I always judged a movie based on how many times I wanted to rewatch it and how many times I quoted it and how, you know, it's like, that's why Ferris Bueller is such a great movie or right. any of the John Hughes films. And, and I do think music kind of plays a part in wanting to see something over and over again. Mm. Um, but I, and again, I, I think I try to, in the things I make, not, not really catfish cause that, that was a different animal, but, I do try to make things that that I would want to see a million times mm. because that's that's the mark of something I don't know that's really good I think. There are some films that I love that I've only seen once and never you know it would be hard to they're hard watches. Mm. But then you kind of pat yourself on the back for getting through them but you never really want to do them again. Yeah. You know, and those and people some people love those movies the most, you know. Mm. So to each to each his or her own or their own mm. Mm. yeah oh go yeah. on go on well i don't know I, I we've we've lost the thread of the original i, know, question, I, I took this okay. off on a tangent i'm so sorry because <laughs> i was just desperate to know what your the, the two movies were so that's me being a bit of a film geek there mm. um no well, we're talking about your journey obviously and um yeah you, you said you started doing um some film oh yeah yeah, stuff. I got into I got into kind of editing, yeah. really. I got into kind of shooting with camcorders and editing and and Final Cut Pro had just come out when I was a senior in in high school. And that was really the first time that you could kind of edit something substantial that was at a decent size, like length and and resolution wise. And that was just kind of endless. I, I remember I remember like calling my parents from school and saying, I I've found the thing I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, after like editing kind of a music video thing, it's just like, I, I kind of had found, I had found it. I found the thing. And I'm oddly, I'm here. I am in my office where I spend a lot of time editing stuff. 
So I was I was right. Um, and then so the way catfish though, you 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 kind of asked the what what was the way into catfish. Mm. So long story short, I go to university, college <laughs> for us, college for you, uni, uni. And I um I studied creative writing and English literature. And I did film stuff on like uh I did film stuff every chance I got kind of for assignments sometimes or or um, I did like a semester abroad studying film in Prague and and then after school I went to LA and I just started uh, editing c cutting directors reels for television directors at the time you could start making DVDs authoring DVDs and I knew how to do that and the industry hadn't quite caught up to that. So I started kind of designing and cutting montages for television directors, guys who did like 24 or um, The Sopranos, Six Feet Under, Entourage, like, and I started branding them kind of like uh, cutting montages and then designing their DVDs. And, and so they were able to send, this was, now everything's online, but at the time that was kind of like not that many people were doing that or knew how to do that. So there was a technology gap mm. that I exploited. And growing up in New York, my best friend um, was this guy, Rel, Ariel Shulman, and his younger brother is, is, is Neve from Catfish. And Rel and I were really, are still really great friends. And his directing partner, Henry, Henry and Rel, they made the original Catfish together and they met through me. Henry went to my high school and I actually borrowed his computer and went to his house every day to kind of edit my final project. Oh, wow. And Rel was a friend of mine who went to another school and we kind of became filmmaking nerd friends. <laughs> and Neve was Rel's younger brother that was just kind of part of the package. He was, a hanging around. He, was a he was hanging around he was a troublemaker he he was a handful he got kicked out of every school he went to and like he rel was just often stuck with him which means that we were stuck with him mm. and you know they while i was in la making stuff i was i i made these directors reels and then i started making content for a magazine called Good Magazine, and I became, that's when YouTube came out. This is all getting boring. But I started making web videos because they were, I had gotten really used to making like three minute montages for these directors. And that translated really well into web content. I had gotten really good at making like three minute, like uh, short films essentially that were sticky and that kept you watching. And that translated really well to web stuff. So while I'm doing all this, Rel and Henry start documenting this really in interesting phenomenon that's happening to Neve, who's always gotten himself into trouble. Here's another piece of trouble that Neve is getting himself <laughs> into. Yeah. And this time, Rel and Henry decided that they would document it as they were documenting kind of everything that was happening at that time. And that turned into Catfish, which I had nothing to do with. Mm. Um, I was just on the other. They stayed in New York. I went to L.A. And they made this crazy documentary that took them years to edit. Like, And I remember them telling me about it. And they were trying to come up with names for it. Like, it, you know, and I was like, don't go with Catfish. That's a terrible <laughs> name. Like, no one's going to want to see that. Um, I, I, I definitely sent them some names for it. And, <laughs> and then it came out, I was, I was at Sundance with a short film I had made there. And of course I was all proud of myself because I had a short film at Sundance and they were there with Catfish and I went to the premiere of it and like, it got this standing, I mean, I was floored. I hadn't seen it until then. And I, the craziest thing was that I couldn't believe that that was Neve in the mm. in the documentary he was so different i was like oh wow like neve has really grown up like he wow he's just turned into a totally 
just menchy, mature, you know, young man. And I was like really proud of him. And I was like, the, the film got a standing ovation. I saw it happen. I saw like the agents and the producers descend on them. And I was like a little jealous and envious. <laughs> yes. I was like, I'm here. I was like standing there with my short film. It was like the shortest film in the festival. And, um, and, and then we had breakfast later on during Sundance, uh, Rel and, and Neve and I, and then they, they told me, you know, I went back to LA, they went back to New York. Um, and they, I heard from them, they came out, like they were doing Ellen, like they were, they were on some crazy world tour. I mean, like, I like went around with them when they were in LA, like Spielberg was watching it. Like oh, it was, man. it was insane. They were wow. on Ellen. Like it, it was just very surreal. We were 27, Max, 28. Was there, Max, was there any point where you were like, guys, why, why didn't you just call? Like I would, I would, been, I would have been well up for this. Yeah. Well, I was, I was busy on my journey and yeah. I, I didn't, I don't know. I'd heard about this thing. And so they came out to LA and at that point I, they told me that, oh yeah, we're, we're talking, we're talking to different people about spinning this off into essentially a, a reality show with, with Neve, like Neve, Neve needs a job. Like he, <laughs> He needs to keep this going. We don't, we don't <laughs> want to keep, you know, we've got other fish we want to fry. And, and, um, and so that was happening. And then I get a call. I had just finished a short film and I'd poured all my money into it. And I was kind of like in a, in a tight spot financially. And I get a call from Rel and Henry saying, Hey, we're shooting the pilot to catfish on Monday. It, it's Friday. We're getting we're, and the guy that we've that we that was supposed to be in the pilot with Neve, like just like we were in the documentary filming Neve, we we wanted a friend of ours and Neve's to be in the doc in the doc series in the the show filming Neve, and that guy has just dropped out for a scheduling conflict, and we don't have anyone else. And do you want? Can you jump in for this weekend? Can you jump in? It's on Monday. And and I was like, well, there's some money involved in this, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. first question MTV. you asked. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some money, and I and I'd also been in LA now for like seven years, and I knew that you know most pilots don't get picked up. And I was like, oh sure, I'll do the pilot, whatever. Like it's what it's films for like five days, and then and then I get the money, and then great. And and so I said yes. And I hadn't really spent a lot of time with Neve where it was just us two. It's like, oh, I, we always had the intermediary of, of, of Rel and, and Henry. And, and so now it was just me and Neve and we, we did the pilot and it was fun and it was funny. And, and the story was crazy. And I was kind of like, fuck, like, this is good. And <laughs> Just because, like, literally because I wasn't counting on it turning into something, it's going to turn into something. I've now signed a six-year contract. Oh, my God. That if it turns into something, I'm, I am, I am in this thing. And it turned into something and there, and there I was. And, and, um, and that is how I came to do Catfish. To answer your first question, <laughs> thank you. It was, wow. well, it was a brilliant journey, and um, there's a few things from pick there. I was just one of the first things I was thinking is that finding your tribe, you know, finding other people that are into the same thing you are, mm -hmm. and how you know finding those people can encourage and inspire you so much, and and obviously and get you work sometimes as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. It, it is it is kind of a blessing that like we were able to because I'm still best friends with these guys and we've got a really good um, we've got a good thing um, and and it is very creative and we do kind of get each other work and it is really special. So, yeah, finding your tribe is really important, especially nowadays when everything is so atomized and people are so um kind of 
incentivized to kind of do everything themselves and not to, you know, not to count on other people. Mm. Um, and I've also just found from just, you know, working for, you know, I don't know, 20 years that uh, really all you get from making a film or a TV show or anything is the experience of making it. It's like, and if that isn't good, then there's, then there's no point because you really don't know how something's going to turn out. You, the ends can't justify the means because you don't know what the ends are going to be. You could have the most miserable time making something and it could turn into the biggest success ever. You could have the best time making something and believe that it's going, and, and it can be great. And it can turn into a giant nightmare of mm. it can blow back in your face like the the result. I've had that, too. So all you can really count on is the the making is the process of making it. And if so, if you're making it with people that you don't like and if it's a slog, then that's all you're going to get potentially. And life is too short, mm. you know. It's good. So, yeah, it's good advice for just life in general, I think, as well. Yes, Wait, uh, wise words from no. I I, I I don't know much, but I do know I do know that. So well, have fun while you're making something. Well, and also I think sometimes it's forgotten how collaborative, creative, in all creative things are. Like you know, I, I write, but you know, once that book gets taken to a publisher, then I'm working with an editor and a sales team and a designer. So whatever you're doing, whether it's playing in a band, for example, and there's a club or making a film when there's loads of people you're collaborating with often, you know, the, I think we sometimes forget that that is a collaborate. All creative things are a collaboration and how beautiful collaboration can be. Yeah. I'm actually really interested in your, I, you know, I, I, I see that you've written a lot and, you know, in, in a bunch of different genres and, and I find writing, I I've, I've written too. And, I find it very lonely. Like, how do you, how do you endure that? I mean, I, I'm sure you go into like a flow state of some kind and it's, it's kind of very wonderful. And, but it's also got to be kind of lonely too. Yeah. Do you know what? What's it like? It's interesting you say that, Max, because I've, I have felt that solitude and isolation sometimes. I've even written, books about you know one of my novels is all about isolation and that it almost became like if you want to go you know full method on it I was feeling very isolated writing it what I've started to do there's two things I do I often listen to music you know you say music's a big thing for you but for me when I'm writing actually compiling a playlist of songs that will evoke certain emotions especially if I'm writing something fictional um, because I often write with kind of almost like a film in mind you know like a, a planet out like that but then also I take myself down to the local cafe near me and I go and I I just like the the background noise, the the hubbub, the actually writing a bit and then having a conversation with someone, um, you know, because I obviously don't work in an office with a bunch of people. Um, I found that really helpful. Um, also, sometimes you can try out material, right? You can actually yeah. just talk to people <laughs> about what you're doing. Um, so I find that really useful. Um but yeah, of course, there are moments where you are very much on your own with it and in your own head as well, which is not always easy. Yeah, I mean, I do love editing and editing is kind of a solitary experience. And that is kind of where the special sauce, if there is one, comes from. But as much as I love editing, I say I love editing and and I'm it's probably the thing I'm most confident about. Um it's re I find it really destabilizing when I'm in an edit for a long time. Like that's where mm. my mental health will, will go out the window, like, you know, ba living a balanced life. Cause it's, it's kind of an addiction too. It's like, you can't, you know, you, you get onto something and then you can't stop, but then you forget to eat and, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, reality just kind of goes away cause you're not tethered to anyone mm or any structure mm. you're just in your own yeah. world of make-believe are you and max are you still in la i am yeah do you and do you live in the sort of city area yeah yeah i mean la if, if you can call it a city area L, you know la is just a bunch of suburbs that are you know bandied together except for 
you know, let's say downtown. Mm. Um, and I've lived in a bunch of different area, di different neighborhoods, but I think we're, we're probably going to move soon. Um, move back to New York actually. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Cause I asked, cause I know exactly what you mean. I'm quite lucky that I live right in the, like literally in the woods. And so for me, when I get into like painting, for example, I always go out for a walk and there's something about um, changing the sort of like depth perception of your eyes and how you, if you're looking at a computer screen for, for hours, for example, and you're not getting any natural sunlight, then you go outside, you're getting the natural sunlight and you're also, your eyes are sort of uh, scanning around and it sort of changes the way that your brain waves work, I think, or something. There's been studies on it or something, I don't know. But I find that really, that really helps for sure. But I, I mean, again, I don't know how how wholesome that would be walking around in a busy city. <laughs> No, I, I, I love that. And I do think that that's grounding. Yeah, I think there's just some element of like needing to ground yourself somehow a couple times over like you like you going to, uh, uh, you know, a, a crowded cafe and, and meet talking with someone at least brings you back to reality somewhat. Mm. But yeah, it's about kind of like not letting yourself go too far mm. before you then come back. Yeah. It's like diving, right? It's yeah. like if you dive for too long and then you come up too fast, like, yeah. you know. So we've talked a lot about this, haven't we? Because we are both creatives, but in very different fields. And so a lot of our friends are also creatives, but I personally don't have that many friends that are creatives in the exact sort of niche as me. Um, and that really helps because you kind of you can get out of your head about what you're doing in the moment for a bit, but also still be on that level where you're talking about creative ideas. And then often if I'm talking to Charles about something he's writing or something he's making or whatever, it'll inspire me in some way and vice versa. So I, I think there's definitely something to be said about that as well. And not necessarily just collaborating with people that are in the same creative field as you, but... But yeah, sort of um, just being around creators in general, I think we all kind of think in similar ways and sort of just on the outskirts of reality, but, you know, dip our toes in a little bit. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, I, it is fun. To, I, that That's why collaborating on film stuff is so gratifying. I, like I was just in Leeds and I was basically living with, my producer and my DP, my, my cameraman. Um, and it, we had a blast. Like it was, you know, it, it was not a frat house, but it was, a, it was a converted vicarage. Is oh, what right. it was. Okay. oh, wow. Were they English, your crew or were they American? my, the producer, uh, is, is English and my, uh, cameraman was American, but it turned, well, Long story, but on our first night, like just we went out to a pub and they realized that they were cousins what? by marriage. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. That's so so weird. my God, that's bizarre. Yeah. But it just like you do create. I mean, that's the great thing about, you know, theater or film is that you do create like a little family. Mm. And and what's great about it is that it also ends you know, it's like my friends who are who are start companies and who are in corporations. It's like, yeah, it's a family, but like it never it's it never ends <laughs> yeah. or it ends yeah. really brutally. Yeah. Whereas like with film, it's like, yeah, we we only have to and do, we own like if we want to get out of this, there is an end point and you just have to survive until that end point. And then you never have to see that person again if you don't want to. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's very true. And also, you, yeah, you can you can call them back and do another thing if you want to right. hang on to them. But yeah, going back to the documentary stuff, because obviously um, that's a big part of your work. Do you feel like you, um, as a person, have a kind of sort of deeper, deeper understanding of, like, I'm, I'm not, this is quite a grandiose, grandiose kind of question, but a, a sort of deeper understanding of how human nature works to say I think you need a certain level of compassion and empathy and emotional intelligence to be a documentary filmmaker would you agree that's you know that's true of you yeah I guess I would it it it's really thrilling and fulfilling making doc stuff 
I mean, of course, there's a lot of different documentary material. Like, you know, sometimes it's just an archival exercise where you're just diving through all the media that existed about this certain thing and then putting it together. And and that's kind of like the jigsaw, the, the, the puzzle of it all. And you're really, from an editing perspective, you're thinking about how the, like the editor in a lot of ways is like the first audience member, right? You're, you put something together and then you watch it as if you're the audience. And so you're constantly putting yourself in the position of like, how will this make someone feel? How, how does this journey, how does this transition, how does this line make me, what does it make me think of? Or what does it make me think about? Um, and so you're always thinking in terms of like the audience, right? And how, how you are crafting a experience for the audience. So that's like baseline. But what's really cool about nonfiction is, you know, and I've I've done I've done a fictional movie that I co-wrote, and I've you know I've I've done that stuff and I've done doc stuff, and they both have great things about them that are very different. But what's great about the doc stuff is that when you are in when you're shooting Verite, which is like what I was doing up in Leeds, um you are you have to be fully in the moment and you've got to be very connected to the people you're you're shooting and like you you basically clear all the space in your brain and you just like download the people or person that you are documenting and you just fill up your entire brain with them and their world and what is happening right now so you are very present you're extremely present more present than you probably are in your day-to-day -day life and and so you it is you are connected to them so there is a lot of empathy there is a lot of compassion but then there's also like a a colder more like where what should i ask next it's very alive right the story mm. is alive and like mm. like what this person what are they doing this weekend and do how do i need to catch it how can i mm. how can i set this up so that i can catch everything that is going on in a way that is honorable and not exploitative mm -hmm. how do i how do i appreciate their boundaries and tell uh, tell the st so you're mentally balancing a lot of things and so it's it's like it's like being an athlete you know to a certain degree because you're very in the moment and you're making a lot of like like decisions and and the but the cool and that's like directing fictional stuff too you're with actors and, and they're live animals and like they have very intense emotional lives and you've got you know this one needs this thing and this one needs the other thing and you need to give both of them what they want even though and you know you're you're a dad you're a psychi psychiatrist you're a coach you're all those things but when you're shooting fiction stuff, you have you have a mark that you need to hit, basically. And yes, like someone can give a performance. You're nervous that you're not going to hit the mark or that you're going to run out of time or that the person's not going to give the performance you need them to give. And then sometimes they really kind of come in over the top of that. And you're like, wow, we got something amazing today. We We got magic. But that level of magic that you're capturing, which is kind of like the high as a filmmaker i think that you get whether you're fiction you're like oh man we 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 had that really tough scene today i didn't know how it was going to turn out and it turned out great that's the high that you get from fiction directing but when you're doing doc stuff shit happens over the course of the day and you have no it's so unpredictable and you just have to be in the right spot to get it and sometimes at the end of the day like you've just you've captured so much magic just like oh my god when that thing happened i was right there and like i got it i got it i heard it clearly i shot it clearly like it, it and you captured something that you woke up that morning and you just didn't know what it was going to be and then at the end of the day you're like i got it and there's a lot more of that that happens in documentary stuff mm. um and that is a very cool like rush 
especially when you've got collaborators too. And like, they were there and they saw like, did you get, you know? And, and so that's, what's really cool about, about, wow. sorry. <laughs> it's a lie. It's unpredictable. Um, <laughs> that's, what's really cool about doc stuff. That said, some of the best stuff I've made comes from not getting the magic on uh, on camera. Um, there was a, a short film that I made with my buddies, my catfish buddies, called A Brief History of John Baldessari, which probably the most successful short that we've all done. And they did this interview with this legendary artist and he gave them one word answers and he was like kind of i don't know if he was like fucking with them or he just didn't want to be there or he's just given a million interviews and he'd been asked these questions a million times but like he kind of just gave them one word answers to all these questions which as when you're documenting something or you're you know it's not good. You want sound bites. You live off of sound bites. And if someone's giving you a one word answer, it's rough. Oh, mm. you know, and Max, Max, sorry, Max, I need to interrupt you. It really reminds me of that infamous Billy Bob Thornton interview that he did on a radio station. I don't know if you've ever seen this. No. Worth looking on YouTube. So at oh, one, God, point, one point, the radio is so, is so intense. Um, one point, the radio DJ um, makes a reference to Billy Bob Thornton being an actor and he's oh, there yeah. with his band and he takes exception to being referred to as an actor because he's there as a singer and a and so for the rest of the interview it's just that it's one word answers it's cutting and it's the is but it's so brilliantly intense <laughs> that it's worth watching because it's so uncomfortable um and I, I assume this is a similar kind of scenario maybe well, it's a it's a challenge and and when you're kind of when you put your editing hat on, they're kind of there are two types of projects. There's the project where it's just like we've we've got problems. We need you to fix this. Here's a broken body. You need to stitch it up and make it beautiful. And then there's the project that comes in where it's like we've got a ton of of amazing stuff, tonnage. It's the problem of tonnage. It's like, how do we fit all this amazing stuff in this very little, in this very little compartment? Um, the easier one to make something good from is actually the broken body. Oh, really? Like when you have to save something, because there's kind of like no end to the tricks you can pull to to make and you just you know when you're coming up most of the projects you're being handed are broken bodies just kind of the nature of coming up but then at, at a certain point in your career you start getting handed like you start getting tonnage like like problems and so you you need to kind of shift gears into like a different different you know strat strategies mm -hmm. but I think some of the best projects come from solving those like broken bodies problems. But this this was a broken body for sure. But we just turned we just kind of leaned heavily on narration. We we ended up getting Tom Waits to narrate it. Oh, um, but basically, we turned all of his one word answers into punchlines. <laughs> that was the solve. So like the 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 narr the narrator would like, you know, uh give the setup and then his one word answer would give the punchline <laughs> and it worked and it it actually captured him in a way that if he had given us um you know actually cogent you know sound bites like it wouldn't have been as good mm. so um anyway it just goes to show that even when you you know, even when you capture magic and stuff like it, it still doesn't necessarily make the thing great. But the high that you get from from being in that very alive mind space where you're like, you know, where is this going? What can happen? You need to. Tr it is like being an athlete where you need to like react to things in real time mm. is really uh, it's it, it is a high and it's really exciting. Do you feel like that kind of bleeds into your 
natural your normal life as well where you're going about when you go to sort of like parties and stuff are you kind of watching people through the lens of a documentary filmmaker yeah i mean if if you've been in that headspace during the day or you know that week then yeah you do kind of look at things that way but it it does go away it does like kind of like fade and and you do you need to kind of like get into that zone and then after you're in it for a little bit i i find that you you go out of that zone too because um part of the the kick or the high is you are a voyeur it but you're like you're like a a permitted voyeur like mm -hmm. people are permitting you to basically put on a cloak of invisibility and pretend like you're not there even though you can ask questions and you can you can have a voice but there is an un it is understood that you are just watching and observing and when you go to a party and stuff <laughs> like I, I do think docu documentary making appeals to wallflowers to a certain degree if you're too extroverted mm. you're not necessarily going to make a great documentarian even though there are there are some um because you have to like reduce your ego down to zero for a long for long periods of time when that comes and back to the sorry sorry um max i was gonna say that comes back to that emotional intelligence though isn't it like knowing when to speak when not to speak kind of understanding body language and how people function and how you know so i think there's a lot of those kind of things are intrinsic with a documentarian totally yeah a hundred percent you need to th that's i guess i was that's where I was going with my answer was that like you you're calling when you're directing anything, you're calling on all of your learnings all at once. And like, so your you know, your emotional intelligence, your past experience with certain types of people that are like the people in front of you. Oh, when I was, you know, eight, I had a teacher who was kind of like this person and how were the, how did I deal with them? And how am I going to deal? Can I use the same? It's like, you're, your brain is like so on fire and you're just pulling from everything at, at, at once. And so it's like, it is a rush of, of, of like uh, everything, everything you've been through, everything you've learned intellectually or experientially you're, you're using right at that moment. So you have to really be on, on point. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is part of the kind of the, the athletic high of, of doing that work. It's almost like a stress response. Your brain quite cleverly can do that when you're under stress. Like if you go to a job interview, suddenly you start like reeling off all this information that you didn't know you knew. And then you come out and you're exhausted because you've used so much of your brain. Totally. I, I wonder as well if you, because obviously when you're a documentary filmmaker, you're kind of surrounding yourself with people that are probably in, at times quite vulnerable as well. Do you feel like you have more empathy in that moment or do you kind of have to switch it off because that could be kind of like a burden in those moments? I don't think, I mean, it's a, that is a good question and it is an important question. And I think, you know, there's a line that that is your that you everyone needs to have it's like at what point it am i prying too too deep um is this person going to regret even though i this person really trusts me at this point are they going to regret saying the thing that i you know that i'm asking but there is and i and this was on catfish too it's like for like season 1 let's say of catfish like people would start to cry and I would want to just jump in and just be like, Oh no, everything's okay. Like here, you know, here's the tissue. Like mm. we all kind of have a natural uh, knee jerk reaction to want to like cheer someone up or, or stop the, stop the pain. And you learn to shut the fuck up when you're a documentary <laughs> filmmaker, like the best thing you could do is not say anything and you do have to kind of override that that instinct to to jump in and give a hug and it's not because you're a sadist and you want to put someone through hell because you want to exploit their pain for your gain even though sometimes you ask yourself is that what i'm doing am i a bad person i i would 
I do think it's justified because I do think everyone wants to tell their story to a certain degree. I mean, you guys as, you know, journalists and podcasters and writers and like all you need to do is ask someone a question about their life and they'll often voluntarily just start gushing. And so they have a lot of kind of unprocessed emotions and feelings and they they want to get them out. And they sometimes they want to cry and they need to cry and they need to. And if you jump in and you stop them too prematurely, then you're you're sending a discourage. You're you're just you're you're kind of inherently telling them that what they're revealing is too much Mm. and too scary and, and that they should even be scared or or ashamed of revealing it. And. And so, yeah, you, and I do think that is a good lesson for, certainly for relationships too. It's like, don't just, don't just jump in to solve the problem. Mm. Let, let people, let people get it out and, and think about it as they're saying it and shut the fuck up. Like just (laughs) shut up and let them listen, you know? And, and that is probably something my wife would tell you that I still need to (laughs) work on. I hear your pain, Max. (laughs) I think my wife- No, you just need to do this. Like, no, why, you know. Let me fix it. Let me fix it for you. I can fix this. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. that's the, that's the men is from Mars, women are from Venus thing, isn't it? That we, you know, we're we're fixers Mm. and women are like to 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 express. We like to talk. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, so just like sitting back and letting people have their cry and not saying anything or just kind of guiding them through the dark emotion, not away from it, Mm -hmm. but like into it further. And you don't need to do much often, but you, it's like, like a word or two of encouragement, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it is, it is like in, in catfish, certainly there's a point at which you just like, if the person is, emoting and and having a moment like you you don't you don't step in Mm. you let it you let it happen and it is on it it does feel unnatural and it still feels unnatural if you know with my wife if (laughs) you know if if she's being emotional and i I'm just letting it, even though I'm telling myself, this is, this is what you got to do. This is what yeah. you got to do. Just it's when she's like saying, turn the camera off that you need to <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, obviously with your documentaries, you've, you've hit on some very powerful subjects. And I've obviously recently with 15 Minutes of Shame, that's a, been a, a big documentary working with Monica Lewinsky and I know people like John Monson, who I've had the pleasure of meeting before. But so I wanted to ask you a bit about how that came about. And obviously it's very current still you know we're seeing cancel culture still getting probably worse and worse so i wanted to just talk to you a bit about that because that seems like a very interesting subject to a tackle but one that's obviously very visceral still i mean that was a it, it was it was a tough project we also did it during the pandemic yeah which made it tough in in both physical ways Cause like, it's hard to document someone when everyone is, you know, masked up and, and doesn't want to let you into their home. <laughs> so that was, that was tough, but it was also tough because there was such an avalanche of public shaming during the, the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And, and what's, so the way that happened is just from, you know, when you're making catfish, and you're kind of in the eye of the storm of the internet zeitgeist, you start to notice things. And like starting around 2015, 2016, there were like, I started to notice like a lot of just meanness. And it was always there. It's not like I discovered it, Um, but like the, the meanness was really starting to go mainstream. Um, and, and it was, it was uncomfortable and it, 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 it manifested with catfish because we would do all this work, this handholding 
to help these people who are deeply ashamed of some aspect of their life. Why else are they catfishing except for maybe like some nefarious scammy ve vengeance thing? But the majority of, of the stories were people who were ashamed or dealing with some mental health issue. I mean, Catfish really, from very early on, the show became about like mental health in the United States. Like, mm -hmm. yes, it's a show about people who are, you know, in love, but <laughs> it's it's not love. It's they need the reason why someone can go for a year plus without meeting someone, the person they're talking to and still be deeply in love with them is because that person is like the one safe space that they have in their life the one person that's telling them that everything's going to be okay and and be by nature of the fact that they are just on the on the other side of the internet somewhere they're safe to tell their secrets to because they're not in their community and and these are people who have had bad relationships with their parents bad relationships with their teachers they've been let down by everyone else and so there is a desperate hunger for a caring, empathetic person. And so it's easy to look past the obvious lies because they don't want sex. Mm. They don't even want, they, they do want love, but they want, they want assurance. They want validation. They want affirmation. They, they don't necessarily want, you know, they do ultimately want sex and that stuff, but they can go without it because what they, what they really need is, is so much more important and, and, and they're so desperate for it. So mm. anyway, we would do that work and then the episode would air and then people would fucking drag or roast the people on who came on the show. And we would have to start saying to them, like, don't look at Twitter mm. when the show airs. And of course they're going to look. Yeah. And I just started feeling like really guilty and bad. It's like, oh, Oh man, like we're we're gonna traumatize these people even more than they already were. And and I don't know, I started to see it up close and personal, and I started to see it in politics and and you know, Donald Trump was starting to run and and all of that vitriol and and anger, all that meanness. It was just like meanness. It was just all all this gross, dark toxicity was coming to the surface. And, and then I, I made a film um, that came out in 2015 and it, it did, it did really badly. And, and because it was, I'm very proud of it. And I, I, I think it's good, but it, I saw the glee with which people wanted to drag the movie and wanted to project a narrative onto the film that was not I I've I've spent my life watching films and like imagining oh some Hollywood executive probably wanted this to change and that's why this movie sucks and I just saw like the I kind of like saw the tsunami coming at me but it wasn't really me it was a movie and so like I was a little I was safe from it but I saw it close enough I just and by it I mean the vitriol but I also mean like the industry of vitriol mm. so like the the clickbaity headlines the 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 takedowns the the hate that was directed at Zac Efron who was in the movie the the celebration from the DJs in the DJ world the film was about music and and electronic music and just these are people who never even saw the movie but it didn't matter because there were all these outlets that were actually monetizing the hate mm. and they were like they were stand up at the silent movie theater in LA. They invited stand up comedians to come and give live commentary while the movie was being shown. Uh, there were podcasts devoted to watching the movie over and over again and, and, um, and basically making fun of it. Oh, man. And, and like, look, as someone who makes content that's part you're making something for people to have a reaction to but the fact that there was like literally an industry like a monet like people there there as you guys know like that that podcast was making money off of off of it like and there were a lot of publications and so between the catfish stuff 
and kind of seeing the way that this vitriol was being monetized, mm. I then like, you know, I was in a slightly down state of mind and I walked into a bookshop and I, I saw, uh, I saw John Ronson's book. So you've been publicly shamed. And it kind of like the title jumped out at me and I read it and I was like, this is really putting its finger on what is going on right now. Like this, this is, this nailed it. And I reached out to John on Twitter and he kind of dodged me for a while. He tried to, he tried, he tried to dodge me, but I was persistent. <laughs> you have to be with John, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and I did, I did get him. Um, I did, I did eventually uh, get through to him and I wanted to put to together a show uh, that was like, you know, based on like a, a doc series based on 15, uh, based on, so you've been publicly shamed. And basically through John, John introduced me to Monica. Monica was actually already starting to develop something with um a and e uh, around bullying and and cyber um cyber shaming and public shaming and we you know monica and i met and we realized that we kind of wanted the same thing and so that is how 15 minutes of shame uh was born and that's why john is in it and um oh i just I just saw that Tina Turner died. No way. Oh. Yeah, my wife just texted me. Oh, man. Oh. That is sad. That's what, a what, a brilliant art yeah. what a brilliant artist. Yeah. I just saw this great We Are the World doc last night oh, that's about oh, to come yeah, out. Yeah. It's really fantastic, and she's in it, and so we were, like, talking about it. So, well, so oh. is, Sorry. That, is that about the recording of the song? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's really fantastic. So in, yeah. in the U.K., uh, on Friday nights, me and my wife watch. Um, so we used to have. I don't know if you've heard of Top of the Pops, which is our kind of like movie. It used to be. Obviously, it's mm. been cancelled. But every <laughs> Friday night, one of the channels shows old <laughs> episodes of it, and uh, it's been the nineties recently. And um, mm. there's been some earlier ones as well. They do some of the eighties, and it was when that was number one in the UK. And the videos just like you go through, and the the amount of huge pop and rock stars that are involved in that song it's unbelievable you gotta see this doc it's really great it's I would called love to the, see that. The, the greatest night in pop the greatest and night it's, in pop uh, okay i'm gonna write this down yeah it's really good it's like we've been playing we are the world all morning oh, <laughs> oh good. What time um you? but um but anyway sorry that's just sad but mm -hmm. um but yeah, so we so we made 15 minutes of shame and and it was tough because there was public shaming is a is a is a thorny topic because it can be used for good. Mm. And the line between where the good ends and the bad begins is is very blurry. And so how do you you know, how do you put your arms around this giant topic and not, mm. you know, throw babies out with bath water? It, it's very nuanced and it is kind of case by case, but it is, you know, it is happening to lots of people, whether it's, you know, kids who are being cyber bullied by classmates or other people on the internet, or whether it's revenge porn, mm. or whether it's, you know, boycotting a corporation you know in which case it's good yes Take those you know, guys so, down. right and <laughs> and and then there are times you you think you're doing well or you think you're doing something good but you're actually doing something not good mm -hmm. and and then there's of course the industry around public shaming like you know the algorithm likes vitriolic you know content mm -hmm. and so you know, when someone, I still get Google alerts for, I set Google alerts for slammed. Like, you know, cause like, that's always like the clickbait headline, like someone slammed or claps back or, <laughs> um, you know, the, these, these very clickbaity headlines that get clicks and that rises to the top of the algorithm, which then creates more outrage. And, 
you know, there is an outrage industry. So it was just like, you know, we had basically 85 minutes to pack all of this very nuanced, difficult topic in. And I think we, I think we did a, a good job um, in the end, but it was, yeah, it was challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and it certainly is still going. And I don't think that the duck, <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe it speed bumped it a little, but it's, I, I don't think people want to hear voices of reason yet. I mean, it's not a new thing. It, historically, this has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, it used to be sort of a, a form of the law, really. Like when you think about people that used to be publicly shamed for stealing or cheating on their partner or whatever, this has been ingrained in us societally for so long. So, I mean, every little helps, though, <laughs> right, in, in trying to stop that. Um, but, yeah, it's... It's easy, I think, you see it on Twitter particularly a lot, people jumping on the bandwagon and getting involved and often it is it becomes a form of sort of entertainment and like physically and chemically within the brain, you, you probably do get that kick and that little rush from sort of piling on and saying your, your part. And like, I don't know about you guys, but I've definitely seen stuff online that's been kind of horrific and you want to share your opinion and be like this is terrible you know you want to join in with the mob <laughs> but well, and i think also i mean I've, I've read um so you've been publicly shown brilliant book mm. i think john ronson talks about like um the fact that it, often when we are jumping on something that um in a very visceral kind of angry violent way is because we think it's coming from some sort of moral or mm. valued thing within us so yeah that's it makes it even more you know, we become even more noisy and more <laughs> violent towards that particular idea because mm. it's it's on a sort of moral valued kind of basis, if that makes sense. Yeah, we turn people into an issue yeah. that we, you know, we don't necessarily get all the facts. And so we, and the fewer facts we have, the more weak, it, easier it is to like turn someone into an issue that we, that we feel very righteous and morally... Uh, opposed to and so it allows us to kind of go off on that person and it's very easy to forget that there is a person and that person's life is going to be kind of irreversibly impacted by it like even if it turns out five days later that it wasn't that mm. the thing that they did wasn't as bad as originally reported like it's oh it's the damage is done no one wants to hear that story no one wants to hear the oh we kind of got it wrong story cuz th they've already it's it's already passed it's already been digested yeah through the 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 giant machine um and i think that on top of what john is saying about the like kind of the moral righteousness and the like you know we we like to get on our high horse there's also like schadenfreude there's this great i mean you guys in the uk you kind of like you guys are were really big into this uh into the public shaming thing um <laughs> and and kind of it invent like it it was this physical kind of torturous thing and then that got outlawed because people got too into it it would yeah it would kind of become too rowdy mm. and it would sometimes backfire yeah. too like sometimes they the the person would become a martyr mm. and it would blow back against the state so they they ruled out they ruled out the physical torture and it became tabloids like that's where the tabloids stepped in and and what you see is that in in very capitalist class where, where there is a lot of um income inequality the amount of public shaming goes up because mm -hmm. people yeah. feel that they are people feel people like to publicly shame people who are above them. Mm. They like to watch them fall. Yeah. And so we really like a good, a good, you know, fall from grace story because it makes us feel a little less loot like losers. Mm. And it make it gives us this ersatz feeling of superiority. This, this, we interviewed this great uh, emotional historian named Tiffany Watt Smith um she's in she's in england 
And that it's, it's my favorite part of the documentary where she talks about schadenfreude is basically we as a, as a kind of world consciousness on social media, we're all comparing ourselves all day long to, and everyone's puffing themselves up too. So we're all comparing ourselves to these puffed up lifestyles and images of these other people, whether they're our friends or celebrities. And we all, there's like, we all feel really inadequate and insecure. And like, we we're comparing ourselves and we feel like losers. And so we're that much more rabid and like, craving those fall from grace stories and those those you know we we really revel in a good in, in a good takedown because it makes us for a moment not feel that way and i do feel like there is a lot of truth to that mm -hmm. and and the more we are aware that 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 might be what is going on i think the more we like i certainly have I've stopped, I have pulled back from social media in a major way during the making of this thing, but also I, I will wait a while before I pile on someone. And, and even then I, I feel like, A, what is my voice really doing? Mm -hmm. And B, like, do I have all the facts? Is there a real person at the bottom of this? Like, how is this impacting them? And And by the time I've asked all those questions, it's just like, yeah, it's not worth it. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes it's nice to type it out, though, and then just leave it. <laughs> it's like you're getting it out. <laughs> yeah, type it out. You can just... enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you can yeah. enjoy it. Look, you, you can read the headline, but you don't necessarily have to click on it. Yeah. Or you could, yeah. like, look, when Tucker Carlson Ooh. got, I mean, like, fuck him. Yeah. And I had a, I, like, I enjoyed that schadenfreude in a very, like, profound <laughs> way and like i i felt it going through my body i texted a couple people we enjoyed it together like you know it's a lot of it people, is a real emotion yeah a lot of people were, re were rejoicing as they should yeah because fuck that guy yeah but <laughs> but yeah i mean like but he is a he he is a public figure who and you're punching up yeah and he you know, it's different than than attacking the hand sanitizer guy who is in our mm. our film. Um, that guy's not a public figure. the 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 story around his his transgression is a little murky. The New York Times kind of turned him into clickbait because they have to compete with Twitter for clicks, and so what you're seeing now is more clickbaity articles from the Washington Post, from the New York Times, from these kind of more, from these 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 publications that know better, mm. you know, but they have to compete because this is the marketplace. Yeah. And and so, you, you know, it's just being aware of those those economics and just being like, you know, does who is this person? Are they a private person? And and, and do I really know everything that they did? Mm. Yeah, it's kind of like the with this hand sanitizer guy and the and people like uh, Justine Sacco, who I know John mentioned in his book as well. They're kind of yeah, it's kind of sh sh like mistakes and ignorance and stuff like that. But I think in some ways you can kind of imagine yourself accidentally doing something stupid like that, and then. And then it makes you worry, doesn't it? Like it's so easy to fall from grace and to be attacked by by people all over the world. I mean, I'm always conscious of what I post and like, oh God, will people get offended by this or will someone take this the wrong way? And even if your intention isn't to offend or to, you know, be racist or whatever. I think it is. you should take those swash stickers down that you've got. <laughs> but why it's like oh. why post anything? Well, exactly. Yeah. You get into that sort of territory, don't you? I've yeah. certainly, I'm in that, I'm still in that territory. Like I've really pulled back. It's like, I mean, I'll post stuff on Instagram, but like on Twitter, if I have a snarky, I don't know. It's just like, I, as soon as you think about, um, I think we, we interviewed someone and they said, you know, when you have to think about how this 
might blow back in my face in every which way every time you write something out like it it mm. it just fills you with stage fright and you're just like why why do i want to go to that place every time i post something and so you just you just That's stop and you know what i i think my life is better for it i don't i i don't cuz cuz when i do post something i'll then first you know we know the anxiety that goes into the post and the, you know, is, and am I getting it? Is this the funniest thing? To, is this the best way to phrase it? Blah, blah, blah. And then you post it and then you spend like 30, 40 minutes, like obsessing about like, Oh my God, like, you know, did, did I say it right? Or, or, or what are people responding? And then, and then like what, all of a sudden this little thing that was just supposed to be like a brain dropping is now taken up an hour plus of my day and it's and what who's is it making me money Mm. is it like is it helping me in any way is it what is it doing Mm. you know so i do think that we we do need to like reevaluate this thing and i don't think things have changed i think they've just gotten Mm. worse i do think people are are more aware and and of clickbait headlines though i do think that they people look at them and they question them a little more now but but yeah i mean we are all looking for a daily villain yeah i mean the, i mean in this country like the tabloids have always been horrendous and i think like you're saying about the clickbait with some of maybe some more of your more prestigious kind of newspapers and publications although we'll you know uh, not the Rupert Murdoch kind of owned ones, but um, like we do see that and clickbait is just, I mean, it's just nonsense. A lot of it is just nonsense. Mm. You know, it's literally nonsense that put, you know, I, I mean, I've had like from other pre- other podcasts I work on, we've had interviews with with people and like a literally a line has been taken out and put into an article and you're like, well, that's not what they said. Mm. And I mean, luckily we have got the, you know, you've got an hour long podcast, you've got long form interviews now where people... It's less likely to get stuff taken out of context, but it still happens because, like you say, newspapers aren't selling anymore. The marketplace is so crowded that that the most sensational stuff is like, you know, quickly rises to the top. And and you don't you're not thinking that way about yourself. But like, right, something that we might have said in this thing, you could take one line out of context and make it very salacious and Mm -hmm. you know i just think that like as we go on anonymity will become more of a luxury and an Mm -hmm. asset like i think you know i think that people who protect their anonymity and are essentially like invisible on on the internet are going to like that there's going to be a high value on that because we're all just so exposed. But do you not think that that will have a positive effect? Because surely the anonymity is what's currently driving people to feel like they can voice quite horrible opinions. Well, good point. I, I'm not talking about that kind of it. I'm not talking about like someone who's anonymous, but but then is like secretly posting stuff. I just mean like someone who, if you click their name, uh, if you if you type their name in on Google, like there's not a lot that comes up on them. Like, I think, you know, I think certainly in the more, the more successful you get in the world, the less you want to give people ammo to take you down. Yeah. Like, unless you just want to snow them with it every day, like Elon Musk or Donald Trump, you know, just like. They're just going to keep shoveling it on you, and so you won't even be able to to find anything because there's just there's too much. I think that I think that less is more. And I also think that, um, and I learned this from Catfish, is that like we humans have a have a very quirky relationship with mystery. Like we can't resist. Like we, if you if you withhold information from someone, they just, they will project, they will project the rosiest thing onto you. Like if you, 
we've all had this where we're in a car, we're walking behind someone and from the back, they look really like they could be the most beautiful person ever. And, and you like, you automatically, you like fantasize about this person. You, you like, Oh my God, like this is going to be the most (laughs) whatever. And then you like, you pass them and it's like, you know, it's like an old man or like it's someone, (laughs) you know, it's just someone completely different or vice versa. Like you're in a car and you're someone passes you and you're like, fuck that person. Like, I hate that person. And you, you pull up alongside of them to give them the finger. And then it's like some old grandmother who like clearly just like, wasn't, Basically, yeah. I'm saying like old people are terrible. <laughs> that's it. That's the clip we're we going to use. Want that's, it. That's, that's the, the clip. Bait. That's the bit. Mm-hmm. Max <laughs> Joseph says he Max hates Joseph old people. Slams old people. <laughs> <laughs> slams. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. <laughs> Got what we came for. <laughs> um, no, we do. We fill in the gaps, and I think we're we're definitely storytelling animals, aren't we? Humans. We love to. We love to aso- make associations with, you know, previous experiences and stuff like that. And yeah, and I guess maybe that goes back to why people, without really knowing all of the facts, love to jump on and, and attack people. And maybe there's some associations there like, oh, this person did this and that reminded me of this person that did that. And they make it personal when it's when it's not And you have to step in and give your voice because as a collective, we need to stand up against this kind of behavior. And if, if I don't lend my voice to it, then I'm being silent and, you know. Should we do that? Oh, just us three? <laughs> <laughs> We're making a pact. Right Start now, a pact. Well, I think it's like, who who is this person? Do they have power? Do they have a platform? Yeah. Do they mm. have a history of doing this? Because mm. I do think like, yeah, like wh- if, whether it's Fox News or Rupert Murdoch or Tucker Carlson, like, or, you know, like the Writers Guild is striking right now. Like mm. these are worthwhile. These this is that is public shaming and that is public shaming, you know, working collective action like that is good public shaming. Yeah. But yeah. then there is yeah. bad public shaming. And, yeah. you know, what do we really want? Do we want the spectacle of just shitting on someone who's done something wrong? Or do we want that person because then you get because this is where I wish the doc could have gone if it were longer, if it were a series is like what works, like wh- what is effective is mm. shaming is shaming the guy is shaming the the hand sanitizer guy to kingdom come and and making him suicidal and putting his family at risk. Is that teaching him what is that teaching him the lesson we want to teach him like if you get and then you start talking about like the carceral system and and prisons Mm. and it's like and it's like you know you look at finland that has like this very kind of progressive uh penal system where the maximum uh uh sentence is like 26 years and the and the prisons are very open and and their recidivism rate is 80 is no is 20 percent you know, where where only 20 percent reoffend, whereas in the United States, it's 80 percent. And we have this very kind of draconian, biblical, mm. you know, shame. You know, we are going to heap, you know, humiliation upon you and and basically turn you into more of a criminal and offender than you were before. And and that kind of goes with our love of shaming people, too. But what does it get us? You know, so yeah. was so it anyway? So it's an interesting conversation. Yeah, it was one of John Ronson's books that he mentioned the Stanford Prison Experiment. I don't remember which one. If it was that one, I don't know. It was you... probably uh, so you've been publicly shamed. Yeah, I seem to remember reading a book that he'd done, and he mentioned that. It's probably the psych- might be the psychopath test. Mm, no, that was great. It's... That's too. also a great book. I mean, we. I mean, John Ronson's fantastic. I think I don't think it was because I think it, basically the, the premise that he was getting at is that we're as humans almost sort of hardwired to as soon as you get that power to just go crazy with it and you know like shame degrade make people feel like they're the lowest of the low low um, and I know there's all sorts of issues with the Stanford prison experiment but I thought it was quite interesting that 
yeah you mentioned that in prisons in america that's part of the system and obviously part of the problem as well and then of course you add the fact that you know guns are (laughs) so easily procured here in the united states and then you get a real big problem yeah and that is a problem that you guys do not have oh do you know yeah, what they we kind of eradicated that quite quickly one what you know a couple of mass shootings okay that maybe yeah. maybe we don't need these anymore yeah um but yeah. i will say though that's one of my favorite genres of personal shaming that i like to watch on twitter is like people you know shaming gun users and gun advocates because of all of the shootings that happen so regularly in america but again, Probably. that's what poten- that has the potential for good. But I don't, I don't think anything. But I guess it's so intrinsically ra- wrapped up in the politics and the amount of money that gets pumped in by the NRA to, to many Republicans. I mean, we could. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> we can. I, mm. One of my next projects. Well, I, I, I won't. But coming, <laughs> coming, coming soon. soon. Mm. Coming soon. Oh, it sounds like it's going to be up our street. Yeah. Well, Max, it's been such, and it's honestly, it's been mm. such a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, it's been great, and I really appreciate you giving us so much of your time because it's we've covered so many bases with you. It's so fantastic, mm. and um, obviously, can't wait to see what you come up with yeah. next. You've been over here filming, and I'm really excited to see that. And um, yeah, what have, are there any projects you can actually tell us about? Yeah, I um, I actually have a little kind of doc series coming out that I'm putting on my own YouTube channel that I've been making over the course of the last year about happiness. Oh, that Ooh, sounds good. That sounds so yeah. cool. Yeah. And uh and kind of looking at it from all the different angles and I I traveled a bunch and I talked to a number of people and it's kind of like 15 minutes of shame but I guess after shame, I needed to, (laughs) I wanted to immerse myself in, in something uh, that was, I kind of brought myself down with the shame stuff. And now I wanted to palate cleanser. Yeah. 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 (laughs) So that, that should be coming out uh, this summer. And I'm, I am really excited about that. And, and I am excited about the digital release of it because as much as I like these longer, um, you know, more mainstream media, projects i get more engagement more conversation and i even think like more eyeballs Mm. on the digital stuff wow that's really interesting that's really interesting you say that because you would think that you know going down a either a cinematic or a or even like a a big streaming platform or something like that but actually from your own channel it's much better Mm. yeah i mean look i've i I made you know a, a doc series reality show i've made a lot of web content i've made films and docs and far and away the thing that that people see the most are the the online doc stuff Mm. like the youtube stuff just weirdly that's cool yeah like 15 minutes of shame this many people have seen and that's on hbo max like Mm. but like my bookstore's documentary that was on yeah. youtube it's mm-hmm. like it, and it's it's crazy like just if people stop me on, on the street it's generally for one of those docs than it is for mm. any like you know more prestigious um mainstream thing i've done so that's i think cool. that that i just think that that's where we're at and also do you does that mean i mean i guess sorry i know we've been talking for ages but um do you have a bit more obviously creative autonomy on those things as well? So is it more satisfying? It's actually your complete vision. Um, it's satisfying. I would, I mean like 15 minutes of shame. I didn't feel like fell short of my complete vision, even though it was like, you know, a collaboration with, with Monica. Um, but it is, the difference between making one of those things and making like something for, you know, Warner brothers or, or HBO max is like making, making a bigger thing like that for, for one of those companies is like driving a a 16 wheeler truck and like, you you know, Mm -hmm. it's slow and you gotta like turn really carefully and, 
and a lot can tip over and you can't no no quick moves and you can't be like mega spontaneous. And when you're making stuff online yourself, it's like a bike. It's like riding a bike. And so it's like, yes, it's you're you are more free to do things and be spontaneous and make decisions and and you don't have to vet those decisions and you don't have to like be diplomatic about you know, how you're going to try to convince everyone to do something, you can just kind of do it. Yeah. And, and maybe they do come out a little more pure. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just, I just think that people don't have time to watch big, long things. It's like reading a book now. Yeah, it's like, it's like, people would rather watch a, a, a short thing on on the internet than mm -hmm. than go on to you know hbo max or whatever and, and click on a documentary unless that documentary is like one sundance or like yeah. won the academy award or like if the book won if your best friend wrote a book you know as a writer like how many of your friends have read have read your books maybe you have really good friends but like this one has yeah oh, all of them actually that no i didn't read your oh, what um, they go so she hasn't read all of the books no but it was only because it was a really sad one and I, okay. I thought it'd be quite my difficult. guess is that you have you have significant amount of disappointment in in oh, friends huge Aww. huge <laughs> <laughs> you've just hit a very raw nerve with me Max. <laughs> what are you talking I mean, that's, about I, that's what i like i feel sometimes now like like making movies and TV shows has become like writing books where it's like not even your, your close ring of friends is going to see it unless it like has won so many awards that mm. they can't ignore it. Yeah. But like, yeah. you know, people's attention spans are shocking nowadays. Well, do you know uh, what, sorry. So I was gonna say a friend of mine who works in the music industry said that now they have this thing called like a waterfall release. You, uh, you might know where I'm going with this. Um, yeah. So they release, singles like you'll get all the singles before the whole album comes out the other thing he said was that now it's optimum on a first single to be less than two minutes so right. we, we we even can't stomach more than two <laughs> minutes of music <laughs> like before getting bored people yeah. people will come up to you Giles and they'll say I I love your work <laughs> they you, don't do that you inspire also. me and they've read only your Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and jo that is your work. Yeah. Giles, you get people messaging you like, I'm thinking of writing a book. Um, would you write it for me? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so they can't the time, even man. be asked to write it. Yeah. Yeah, got, yeah. I've got an idea for a book. Would you, would you write it for me? <laughs> yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's so true. But yeah. also, I think people, you know, pho we've phones and laptops and stuff, YouTube instagram twitter it's all so accessible like i don't even have a tv like i wouldn't even know where to go to watch a proper documentary or film like i'm here that's what i'm that's what i mean that's what i mean it's like youtube it it is far i mean it is on its way up mm. that digital digital distribution and uh and i do think it's really fun to make that stuff the other thing is it, it's more fun you can come up with an idea you can come up with an idea, decide to make it and all the, like in one day. Yeah. Whereas, whereas if you're trying to get a book published or trying to get a TV show made, you're talking about years. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of that time is not even spent doing anything creative. It's like, it's negotiating. It's waiting for someone to call you back. Like it's, it's, you yeah. know, life is too short. You've got yeah. too many ideas. <laughs> touched another nerve another nerve was touched yeah. there yeah <laughs> also i'd imagine that with <laughs> with documentaries and stuff and tv shows whatever you're if you're, do, if you're doing it for yourself and you're planning on releasing it on your youtube channel or whatever you're thinking about it from the perspective of your creative vision and the viewer whereas i could imagine with documentaries that are going to go on mainstream media you're thinking about it from the perspective of the commissioner and no one else because you're like well we've got to get it commissioned so well, you're you are doing the mental balancing act of trying to honor all of the all of the you know how can I honor the audience and honor the executives and honor the this and and you know when you're lucky they're all pulling in the same direction. How can I honor my original vision 
the thing that I know the executives want and the and the audience. And like, if you're lucky, you, you know, those are all the same thing, but they're generally slightly different or sometimes they're vastly different. And yeah, like ultimately, and it's funny because all the things that get you to the green light, it's like, it's like, it's kind of like dating. It's like a lot of times all the things that like get you the date or like that go are are kind of completely antithetical to having a long relationship. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like you again, you have to like shift gears really fast. And like, you know, once you've got the thing, like once you've sold the thing, then you have to like switch gears from like selling it into yeah. uh, some long term strat like diplomatic strategizing as to how to now mm. Trojan horse. Yeah, yourself, that... your actual authentic self into it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did I say I didn't drink? <laughs> I meant uh, I didn't drink all the time. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that is nice about the digital stuff. But it is also like lonelier. Mm. And like, and you can only do certain things without the money and cushion of. But anyway, we, I mean, if you want to if we could go that's a whole other can of worms digital versus mainstream mm. it's really well. interesting because i've been i've been involved in a in a film project that's not quite happened and um <laughs> can already see that there might be other avenues i should maybe be looking at yeah yeah it's good it's a good point also I mean, podcasting is it's great you have the freedom to just decide who and what and then you go on twitter and you reach out to people and and you know sometimes it comes back to you and it's cool i mean it's cool i i it's definitely more f it's more fun on a process level than 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 the mainstream way but if you can get enough money to actually execute something you wanted to do that's big and you can surround yourself with people that you know you vibe with and like working with and you have the money to pay them, then they're happy, you're happy, you know, and, and you do have this little Garden of Eden moment. Of course, once that ends and you get into the edit and then everyone wants something yeah, different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You know, by the time the movie comes out, everyone hates you for a different reason. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the project that you've created. <laughs> right, right. They hate you <laughs> and they hate the thing. And then you're like, why? Yeah. Why did I want to do this? <laughs> Oh, Max. Max on, oh, well, we said that at the same oh. time there, look, simultaneously. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Honestly, it's been such a treat to talk to you. And thank you so much for you your too. time today. Yeah, really, really enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah.